Welcome into Career Evolution, planning your next step in your career. It's brought to you by Work Life VC. I'm your host, Adrian Lawrence, and for the next 45 minutes, you are going to be a party to a thoughtful conversation on how to think about what's next for your career amid all that's going on with this global upheaval and accelerated change. And moderating this panel, it's none other than founder and CEO of Her Agenda. That's Ronisha Bing. The panelists we have include Claire Wasserman, founder and chief brand officer at Ladies Get Paid. I can definitely get behind that. We also welcome Adrian DeWolf, co-founder of Heroes, and Matt Schulman, founder and CEO of Trove. Ronisha, take it away. Thank you, Adrian. I am so excited to be moderating this thoughtful conversation with industry leaders about how to think about what's next for your career in the middle of a pandemic and a world that is constantly changing. I wanna remind folks that at the end of the moderated Q&A, there's a chance for us to answer your questions and we want you to use the chat box to answer your questions so that we don't miss it. There's a specific chat box that says Q&A. You wanna put it there, not the main chat room. So during our convo, we will get try to get through questions that address three aspects of this topic. One, how to prepare for the unexpected. Two, how to take ma matters into our own hands. And three, how to lean into change and practice self-care. So as far as the first aspect of what we wanna go over, how to prepare for the unexpected, anyone can jump in here um, if it speaks to you. So all of you are founders with past lives. And by that, I mean you've worked for others and experienced the pivots of a career. How do you best prepare yourself for sudden career changes? And how has COVID shifted how we need to think about preparing for career crises? Um, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, so first of all, you, well, thank you for having me. You cannot do what you want in your life. You cannot be independent if you don't have savings, if you don't have the money to do it, um, especially negotiating, right? The people who are the strong negotiators are the ones who are able and willing to walk away from something. So we got to get our savings together. Um, and the other thing is, and, and this is speaking from a personal point of view here, is a network. I kind of imagine a network like a safety net because whatever you need in your life, it's hard if you Google it, right? Like you're doing cold outreach, right? Chances are they don't respond. If you've been building a network all along, and this is a diverse network, by the way, because if you decide you may want to pivot in your career. So making sure that you have people in your life whenever you have a question or you need something to be able to go to them. And, and the one last thing I'll say about networking is making sure that you've developed relationships with people that I call portal people. Uh, and these are folks who are incredibly well networked themselves. Um, you can probably think of them right now, right? These are community leaders. Um, they could be the head of an organization. I mean, we all know somebody who just knows everybody, right? Uh, and that's the person to go to because whatever you need something or have a question about something and you can't think top of mind of who could be the person to help you, chances are that portal person can then connect you to somebody they know. And so don't wait until you need something to go and get it, right? This is a good practice to be developing all along, right? Right? So we got the savings and we got the network as a safety net. Facts. Did Claire cover it all? Or did Matt or Adrian want to chime in with any thoughts? I mean, I, I would say out of personal experience, um, you're never that ready. You know what I mean? You'll, you're never going to be ready for a career change. I mean, obviously you have to be, but there's no world where you're like the perfect person to, ooh, now nah, let's go for a new career change. It's going to be great. It's always going to be super challenging. But what I found helped, I agree with Claire Tully on the network part. That is super powerful. And that's been, I, I always make the joke like I never, it's a bit bad, but I never found a job by applying to it. I always found a job always. Me too. <laughs> Me yeah. too. I've never called applied. It's all been through relationships. Exactly. Yeah. And my mom would always say, you know, it's for your resume. I'm like, sweetie, I've never used my resume. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's really sweetie, that's cute, but I don't need a resume. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's great <laughs> to have one for sure, especially when you're in an interview and you can, you know, go over it. Uh, I mean, it's the best way to kind of summarize yourself when, you, when you're talking to these people in the higher ups and in the interview process. But I can clearly resonate with Claire and the network, I think, is the most powerful thing. Um, especially nowadays where in crisis like COVID, where in any industry, uh, in any job type, people are bombarded with applications. Um, and, you know, at Heroes, uh, 
the way we filter through application for companies is giving the video aspect um, because it is so hard to filter through. But for any job, even if it's at a higher up level or in a corporate level, I think it's going to be even harder to pierce through, you know, that job pile. You can make your CV look nice. You can, you know, edit it. You can, some people are, we're seeing are like sending personalized videos. Some people I've seen online have sent like gifts and packages, surprise to like the, the, wow. the recruiter. Like people are really going for it. But at the end of the day, I think to really stand out, um, there's nothing warmer than an introduction. Um, and it goes actually in the VC world as well. In tech, when you, know, when you raise money, there are some VCs that will blatantly say it on your website. You, know, you can send us the pitch, but if you're not giving us the pitch with a warm introduction behind it, the chances are we're probably not going to reach out to you. So it just, shows, it just goes to show that, um, yeah, I think network, uh, and Claire, you're totally right, um, is a good way. And I think to add on to that, I think, for me, I used to be very stressed at networking events because I would be like, oh my God, I need to meet everyone uh, one by one. And I would try my best to go see everyone, which was such a waste of time and very tiring and very stressful experience because you're like, I cannot leave this event before I do not speak to everyone. Um, <laughs> I think it's just um, acknowledging that your network is everywhere. Like literally, I the most interesting people I've met was like in an Uber pool in Paris or like in a train somewhere or on like a holiday. Like yeah. you should have that self-awareness of, you know, the person next to you or in front of you could always bring you something, right? They always, they might know a client, a potential client for you. They might know, it might be your future employer, you know, might be your, your next co-founder, who knows? Um, you never think, know who you're sitting next to, so. Exactly, it's always my always room. Be your authentic self and, exactly. and don't be afraid to share what your hopes and dreams and goals are because you never know who they know. Exactly, well, we summarize it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that we can all agree that this pandemic has truly exposed both the vulnerabilities and the strengths of every industry. And for this question is specific for people who are in those vulnerable industries. Do you think that they should try and stay and continue to grow on their current track? Or if not, how should they begin transitioning out of their industries, especially in a highly competitive job market? Anyone can take that question, by the way, that specific to anyone. I'm going to make Matt speak because you didn't speak last yeah, time. Yeah. I don't want to monopolize it. I didn't so, want to put you on the spot too much, but I'm sure you have. I did. Okay. Thanks, Claire. I no, I was, I I was quickly going to respond to the first question, then I can give you my thoughts on the second one as well. I, I had two thoughts Feel about, free. you know, uh, navigating this. One is that you have to be relentlessly optimistic because things always go wrong. You always are going to meet so much adversity. Uh, and there's two ways to look at it. One is to get really deflated at the end of a really bad day where things didn't go according to plan. The other way is to sort of laugh and view it as a source of strength. If you can use that friction that you experienced during that day as a source of like optimism for the future. So that would be the first thing I would say. And the second is just being really intellectually honest about what's going on at any given point in time. I think a lot of people fall into this inertial trap where they are sort of like, you know, going through the, the process of something and are afraid to, to get off that path or go to something new. Um, but like really look at the mirror at the end of the day and ask like, is this actually what I want to be doing? Am I actually making the right decisions? If I'm working hard on something, uh, is the signal that I'm seeing from the market or from uh, my colleagues, wh whatever is relevant in that context, is that actually pushing me uh, in, in the direction that I want to be going? And that can be really hard to do. So yeah, uh, I think that optimism and intellectual honesty is like key to, to navigating a, a change in any career. So those were my thoughts for the first one. Um, in terms of like, whether you should stay in your comfort zone uh, or you know, you know, something that might be in an in industry affected by COVID or, or go for a leap. Um, I think it depends a lot on the context. I think uh, partially you have to just like understand like the matrix of combining what you're good at and what you're passionate at with what like makes sense in the world right now. And it, I think it just, it matters a lot about the context. Yeah, and I, I was just gonna piggyback off of kind of reevaluating values and looking in the mirror because that one should be doing this quarterly anyway, right? And so when we're in a place of transformation uh, or transition like a pandemic, uh, that is the time to reflect because you actually have an opportunity where things are kind of slowing down around you. And I would just recommend figuring out what really lights you up, right? What are the things that you get into flow about, right? Where you have a lot of energy. What are the things that come naturally to you? I think oftentimes we equate work with hard work, right? So if something wasn't difficult, I'm not working. 
I'm going to speak, this is personal experience, all of this, and not realizing that whatever is second nature to us, whether it's somebody loving to network um, or you are a person who, you know, you're kind of the therapist to all your friends or you like planning events. Like these are all skill sets that can be used. And this, I think, is a great time to really take them seriously. Um, so I think reflecting on if this is hard, is it situation? Is it situation? Are you at the right company? Um, is it the right environment for you? Are you on the right path? I mean, this is a time for existential crisis. So instead of kind of looking to the future, you know, immediately I would say maybe take some reflection in the past and what are the clues um, where you have felt like there's momentum in your life uh, and seeing is that a path forward for you? And then of course, always looking at the market, can I even make money from this thing? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Claire, I completely agree. Um, often what I say to my friends and to myself is like, if you think back over the last, I don't know, one year, five years, 10 years, whatever the time horizon is and think about, all right, what were the like days that just brought so much energy to me where I like jumped out of bed at 5am because I was so excited about what I was going to be doing that day. Like everybody has those days. And of course there's the other days where you're just hate what you're doing that day. Think of what days gave you that most energy. And that probably is something to double click on and, and understand, well, why did that make me passionate? Right. Why did that get me at, so motivated? And uh, usually I think that's a good starting point to figure out, all right, well, what do I want the next chapter of my career to look like? Totally. That's a super important point uh, that Claire and Matt made. Uh, a lot of the time, the things that come to us the most naturally that are part of just our personality are actually skill sets and we don't recognize it as that because it comes to us so easily. Just a personal example for me, my career started as a journalist, a reporter. I was always called, called nosy as a kid. And that's curiosity, which is a skill that you need in order to ask the right questions and be a great journalist and be a great reporter. I never thought about it that way until I took a journalism class by accident in high school. And I was like, wait a second, this is a career? So definitely evaluate yourself, what you love, what your skill sets are, what your personality traits are, actually. And that can be your skill sets that lead you to a new path. Adrian, did you have anything to add or did we cover it? No, I mean... I kind of agree with, with you. It really depends on the situation, right? I wouldn't want everybody to change their job just because it, it's in a risky time. Um, you know, the high risk, low, high reward. Maybe if you make it through this time, you'll probably be rewarded afterwards if you like, I don't know, build your company back up or, or, or like, you know, manage and let your team throughout this hard time. The, you don't always have to run away from it. But again, if you're not passionate with it um, and if it's really struggling, then of course um, you should move on. Um, but I think there's going to be some great after effects of where people stayed in the company and they probably came up with more innovative ideas. As Claire said, you know, it really brings a lot of time to reflection. So, you know, they might have ideas that they might have not had before and the company might actually come out stronger than it ever was before. So, yeah, I think it really depends on the context and of the, the situation. Yeah. And I do want to get a chance to get down in the weeds with this type of topic. So if you do have a question around this and you have a specific scenario, definitely add that to the Q&A chat, the Q&A box to make sure that we're able to get to that at the end of the conversation. Um, I want to move to taking matters into our own hands. And Claire, you talked about this, about building your network and the importance of community around you. So I want to ask you about, you know, with the time that we're in, with social distancing protocol being in effect now and possibly for the near future and, you know, this fear about a second wave possibly coming, how do you genuinely and authentically grow your network in this digital playing field? And what do you think from this time will stick around after all of this is done? Yeah, yeah, and I... I, I'm just also going to give Matt a shout out here about relentless optimism or positivity, seeing the opportunity. I think this is a great time for networking. First of all, people I think are more generous. Uh, you know, there's a universal shit storm that's happening to everybody, right? Like when is a time where we all have something in common, right? We have that now. Um, so there's that. Uh, second, this is great for uh, introverts, um, which I actually am one of them. Um, I get very tired from, from networking. I think Adrian made that point well. Um, one thing I would recommend for everybody to do is just get very clear on what your goals are with networking. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to have one goal. Um, but in order to know who, who to connect with, right, you have to have a sense of what it is that you're looking for. Think about those portal people, see if you can go to them and maybe ask them for a recommendation, something specific. Like I think a person in this field who maybe, you know, five years into the field, maybe you're like new and you want to talk to somebody who's just a little bit older. Do you have a suggestion of who to talk to? 
Cold outreach is totally fine. Uh, ladies get paid. We have met the most incredible women who have become speakers, uh, angel investors, right? And it was all cold outreach on LinkedIn. Here's the thing though, when you send a note to them, you wanna be, you wanna make it really personal. So do your research on them. Find, you know, hey, I saw you speak at this conference. Um, I saw that you were in this LinkedIn group. I mean, don't be too creepy about it. Uh, it's like stalk them, but maybe don't let them know you stalk, stalk them, but you know, why them? And then what it is that you wanna ask them. So maybe one to three bullet points. Um, what you want to demonstrate is that you respect their time because that is honestly the most valuable thing you know that anyone has but particularly somebody who's maybe a little bit higher up so perhaps ask them for a quick you know 15 to 20 minutes chat give them an out right we could also just talk by email you know whatever works for you and do what i call polite persistence yes i love alliterations okay polite persistence so if you do not hear back within a week definitely reach out again acknowledge that you've reached out before you don't want to bother them right and maybe reach out one more time, like 10 days after. Uh, there are people in my life who did not respond to me then. And guess who has come back to me and wants to do things, right? So what your goal here is just to get on people's radar uh, and be very thoughtful and always, always offer people support. What can I do to help you? A fantastic book to read, which I have a feeling both Adrian and Matt will know this book, but Give and Take by Adam Grant really great. I don't know how much he talks about digital networking, but the ethos of networking, according to him, is absolutely transferable. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the more you pay it forward, the more you connect other people, the, the more you'll be connected, right? That's also sort of demonstrating the behavior that you want to see. So, you know, long story short, kind of shoot your shot, see if you can get intros from people, be very personal and specific, and it will happen. It will happen. But, you know, as much as we want to connect with people who are way high up, I would maybe start again, just a couple of years ahead of you because they're probably more willing to connect with you and you can kind of build from there and keep getting those introductions. Amazing. Um, Adrian, you talked about networking before and I want to hear your take on how you digitally network because I think it was super valuable what you said about connecting with just you know, one, two, or three people having that deep connection versus trying to talk to everybody in the room. So what has been your approach during this pandemic with connecting with your network and connecting with people? Yeah, I mean, yeah, in the beginning, I was kind of pissed off as well, like many other people. I missed the dinners and I missed the, the traveling and the, 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 the potential to network and the opportunities. Um, but then I actually use a lot of TikTok. Um, I know it's a bit for like more Gen Z people, but my app is for Gen Z, so it's you know part of my job to look at the, the 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 TikTok app every day and kind of get inspired. And there was this really cool TikTok a long time ago that came up, and I've I've been applying it ever since uh, in this digital world. It's like a rule is that every day you reach out to one person, um, and it could be like it doesn't have to be you know something specific. It could be one day like you read an article, so you reach out to the reporter because you like what they said. Could be one day you see a TED talk and you really like the, the TED talk, so you reach to, to him. Or one day you read about a company, for example, in the news that just raised five million or that just launched a new product. You're like, oh my God, I love their branding or I love their their marketing. I wonder who is doing their marketing for them, you know? And and so you can reach out multiple ways. You know, Instagram, I love reaching out on Instagram. People are like super attentive to their Instagram. They yeah. reach out super easily. Uh, LinkedIn, obviously, on a more professional level. Uh, and as Claire said, uh, I'm often surprised by how much people respond. <laughs> like, um, maybe it's COVID, you know, maybe you're right, maybe Claire, because I haven't really done that before COVID, but I guess maybe, you know, COVID people are just more generous, a bit more bored and, and need that human interaction, right, than you normally had prior. Um, and so I found that really helpful. Um, I think it's always super inspiring and we, a lot of them always convert into like a Zoom call or a Google Meet. And I always learn something. I always, and I always have them in my network. And, some of them actually, we employed them after it. You know, we had a conversation and we're like, oh my God, you should join our team. And now we're, we already made like two job offers to, to these two people. So, um, That's and wow. yeah, and I don't, you know, it's just for employees, but it's, I don't, it can extend way more. It could be, I don't know, a friend, it can become a future co-founder again, as I said, I can become even a potential investor. So um, I think applying that rule of, you know, reaching out to one person every day, I think it's not too hard. It's, takes minimum effort, but you, the, the impact you have from it, it's, it's pretty cool. So I highly recommend people to, to follow that. It's interesting you brought up, you know, the fact that you've hired people through this. And I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I can go to Matt for this since you just spoke to give you a little breather. But um, Matt, you are the founder of Trove. So you 
you know, you see every day, you know, different offers and opportunities that people get that's kind of built into the background of your company and why you exist in the first place. So what happens if someone is offered a great opportunity that is not really exactly what they had in mind? Um, how do they maintain their strength and still negotiate in this time, um, despite the current job market it's so competitive out there? Yeah, I mean, it all starts uh, foundationally with transparency and just understanding what's on the table. I think with a lot of job offers, people don't understand what's in the cards in terms of equity and, and what the cap table looks like. Uh, and part of it is just because it's really confusing and it's tough to get an understanding of here's what a stock option means at company A versus company B. Um, but it's just very important to understand what are the facts, what should I be asking for, and then uh, promoting a, a culture where employers feel compelled to, to share all the details about what an offer looks like at company A or company B. Um, I think sometimes people fall into the trap of, you know, if you're getting stock options from a startup, like a thousand stock options at company A is less than 1500 start, uh, stock options at, at startup B. Um, and people are just uh, maybe intimidated or unsure of which questions to ask. So I, I would say it all starts foundationally with uh, transparency and understanding what's on the table. Um, because maybe you are taking a pay decrease to go to an earlier stage venture, as an example, but um, you won't really know until you understand the equity. Or if, it, if you're in sales, it's about understanding what are the details of the commission? What, what could this look like into the future? Uh, and then more broadly speaking, I would encourage candidates to understand, like, what, what is the, the philosophy of the, the company that I might be joining in terms of promotions and in terms of a merit-based culture? Or, you know, how does good behavior get rewarded? Um, so I, I would just encourage all candidates to always be asking those questions. And that will be a good foundational point to understand, is this a good decision that I might be making to go to a certain company? And if not, how can I learn more to inform my decision? Awesome. And Adrian, you deal a lot with the, the job market in particular. What thoughts would you give to someone just to have the strength to even negotiate in this time? You, they get this offer and it's like, oh, it's not really exactly what I wanted in terms of the package or the benefits or the, the compensation, but I don't have anything else right now and rent is due next week. So I, I didn't understand the question. Is it like negotiating their contracts or their, their benefits? And negotiating anything that they get an opportunity, you know, some people say take any opportunity because it's presented to you. So what advice would you give to someone about having the strength to maybe walk away or say no, or to speak up and say, actually, can you give me X, Y, and Z? That's what I would require. Yeah, I think obviously transparency is like the, the, the biggest, uh, biggest advantage when you're looking at job offers, like full honesty and transparency. It's always super disappointing and frustrating for both parties, you know, when you realize that the job offer is disappointing at the end of the process, well, as you could have understood, you know, if you, if as an employer, you ask, you know, the potential employee straight up, that's what I always do in the first interviews before they even move to the next stage. It's like, listen, what's your salary expectations? What do you want? Um, so that there's no, you know, frustration or misunderstanding later on and waste of time, basically, of like doing all these interview rounds and actually realizing it's never going to be a match. So I think just honesty and transparency is super important. And normally, if you apply those two rules um, in a normal world, uh, you should be able to, you know, level, le level up and through the different interview processes and the different stages at the end, end up at a, you know, at a, at a potential match. Um, I think it's always very frustrating when you do a very successful interview round, like one, two, three rounds, and then it drops off because of like just details in the job offers or like mm. misunderstanding. That's the worst thing that could ever happen because uh, you wasted a lot of time, the applicant's time and your colleagues and your team's time. Um, so yeah, just full transparency and honesty and, and asking the hard questions. Sometimes it is a bit uncomfortable for employees, you know, when, when, when you ask them, you know, what's your salary expectations or what do you want or what are you making now or things like that. But I think it's, it's worth asking them in the beginning to not have that um, uncomfortable situation or disappointing um, result at, at the end of the interview process. And Claire, I know you could go on about this all day because this is all you, but just one quick tip yeah. that you could give so that we can make sure we have time to answer the audience questions. Yes, yes, I teach this. Uh, and again, I don't want to monopolize. Uh, I want to just answer your question, uh, the part of your question where you ask, you know, do you just take the job? Mm -hmm. This is kind of goes back to what I said originally. You can't do anything if you don't have money. So there is no shame in taking a job. Listen, if on your resume 2020, there's like, a random job, no one is going to look at this and go, hmm, why did you take this job, right? This is kind of the, the get out of jail free year. We can all do whatever we need to do to survive, right? That being said, my advice that, you know, was very different before 2020, which would be if you have the money to be able to say no, 
because the opportunity is not right, then say no. Because otherwise you're going down at least a year of your life where you are, it's hard to get back on track, right? So I would say just make sure everything is aligned with what your values and your goals are in your career. Again, kind of back to the first part of the conversation about the alignment of your energy and, and all of that good stuff. Um, if there's an aspect of the job that you think you could leverage for the future, whether you know, you're learning a new skill or you know, the title of the company is kind of fancy, right? Or you wanted to break into tech and here's a way to do it. Uh, in my case, I knew that I wanted to start my own company. So I explicitly went to a startup. It was five years old, but it was a small team because I wanted to see on a ground level, how do you grow a business? The kind of business it was also was aligned with what I you know, was interested and wanted to do in my life. But if you don't have that opportunity that, you know, that has it quote all, which by the way, there really is no such thing as having it all or having a dream job. It's just how many aspects uh, of this opportunity can I maybe leverage for the future? And that means you do have to know a general direction you want to go in. That being said, if it is a random job because you need to pay the bills, no shame, no shame at all. And you yeah. should always negotiate, but again, the year no whole other topic. Yeah, this is definitely the year of grace. I want to talk about tools too. So Adrian, you know, you're a founder of a platform that has, a, that is a tool. Um, we know about LinkedIn, we know about, you know, different job boards and things like that, but what are some of the latest tech tools and learning platforms that people can use to work smarter and not harder in their career transition? I want to start with Adrian and then have everyone else jump in after. Sure. Well, I have to specify like Hero's Job, we really focus on like high volume hiring. So our clients are companies like H&M, Panda Express, Chipotle. Um, so it's not corporate jobs. It's really jobs in store. So like customers facing jobs. Yeah, for young uh, people. Sorry, yeah, exactly. Gen Z, young people uh, and older people actually, especially now with, with video, more and more uh, older folks are, are using our app to find the jobs. But uh, at the end of the day, the tool that we use specifically is the video part um, because you know, for young people specifically, they don't understand LinkedIn. They don't really like it. <laughs> they feel like it's really annoying to describe yourself when you don't have much to say about yourself because you're so young. Um, and that they rather show themselves authentically via video than via p paper resume, you know? Uh, young people, especially with TikTok and Instagram and all the FaceTiming apps, uh, they love showing their personalities uh, via video. So we use that tool or that proxy as a tool um, so that they can, you know, present themselves and apply via video. Um, I've seen video as well using corporate jobs. Um, I think video is a very powerful tool that's definitely the center of our startup uh, because it does have that like authentic connection. Um, it's so insane. Like every day I, I use the app obviously to, to, to check it out. And like when you see a video, like in a second, you know, you can see like, okay, I like that person. It's a match. We should hire her. Um, on a resume, when you're, especially in COVID now, where you're like bombarded with like more than 500 resumes in your Indeed account or your inbox, it's really hard to go through them. And even the best resumes might not give you that spike or, you know, uh, but with a video, like it's, it's just so powerful. Um, and I'm actually super happy. Well, I'm not happy, but the fact that COVID came made video, it even normalized it even more. Uh, as, as you were saying, you know, older people are actually joining our app because maybe before COVID, they were a bit more uncomfortable with the videos. But now, because they had to FaceTime, I don't know, their kids or their grandchildren or, um, they, they, you know, they were in Zoom calls more and more. It kind of normalized videos for even the older generations. So um, everybody's kind of getting the feel of it and the hang of it. And I'm, I, I really think the future uh, of LinkedIn or whoever will be, hopefully will be us heroes, will be a platform where it's really going to be video on both sides, on the employer side and on the, on the user side, because there's nothing more powerful than, you know, than a video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I have another video tool that I was going to talk about that relates to what you were saying and also what Claire was saying earlier. Uh, and it's Loom. I love Loom so much. Yeah. I like, you know, you were asking about how to work smarter, not harder. Well, I used to write like these like well-crafted emails and try to wordsmith it and spend 20 minutes finding the perfect way to phrase statements. Uh, but what now I do is like, I'll just go to Loom and make like a one minute or a two minute video. And if I'm reaching out cold to somebody on LinkedIn, like Claire was saying earlier, or it's for a sale or it's for a recruit or something. I just find that it is so personal and it actually takes less time and it just is such a better way to connect with the person. So I am the biggest uh, advocate for Loom in many, many different contexts and it, it has sort of revolutionized how I do this asynchronous communication. Thanks for that tip. I, I never heard of it. So you should get it. It's really cool. Make sure you get commission. Although hopefully I don't have to pay for it. I don't know. 
well, let's talk. I'm sure there's different better. levels as <laughs> with awesome. any service. <laughs> I think yeah. there is a free tier. Yeah, generally it's like there's a nice little circle at the bottom left where it shows your face and then you can sort of show where you're pointed on the screen and it's, it's fantastic. Amazing. Claire, did you have any tools that you wanted to add? Um, I know for me, there's so much power in digital communities. There's like so many Slack communities dedicated to opportunities and sharing jobs from the hidden job market. And I, Her Agenda actually has one called Her Agenda Insiders, where we are just sharing things. You might be internal at a company like a Google, and you know that they're hiring for something, but maybe they haven't posted the job yet. And you share in the little Slack, like within this trusted community, hey, we're about to hire for marketing or this or that, here's the application and I can refer you. That has been super, super powerful. So find those like different Slack and digital communities. Um, Claire obviously has one with Ladies Get Paid. Um, any other tools or anything to help people in career transitions work smarter? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, our whole business was built on Slack. Um, we have over 40,000 women active on Slack since 2016. We've exchanged almost 2 million messages. So they have a lot to say uh, to each other. And listen, I mean, join ours, but, uh, and, and of course yours as well. Um, but you can create your own. Um, it's a, a space, you know, of different channels based on different, issues you're having, right? Salary negotiation or jobs or, you know, burnout. I love Airtable. That, that's more of a, you know, how do you keep yourself organized, um, you know, as you are looking for work or, you know, working on different projects. It's basically a fancier spreadsheet um, and there's different templates based on what it is that you're looking for. So something I've done is I exported all of my LinkedIn contacts and I put them into Airtable and I mean, this is kind of, this is like next level, but, uh, you know, understanding who do I know, what do they do, what kind of access they have, have we communicated before? Um, because when I need something, again, back to like the safety net part of the network, hopefully you know a lot of people, but here's the thing, it can be overwhelming. So making sure that you have a place where everything is that you can really quickly see who can be helpful to you. And I find Airtable to be a good way to organize it. Yeah, that's a, a awesome. And a lot of people don't know that you can actually export your LinkedIn contacts. And it takes a lot of time, but I think it's worth investing that time to get all your contacts organized because, you know, a lot of times we don't know who we know. And that's a good way to get in front of you and make sure you're maintaining those relationships. So we have about 10 minutes left and I want to get to the Q&A, but before I do that, I want to go into one last question that talks to leaning into change and practicing self-care. So we all know that there are stories of people who have faced upwards of 100 job rejections and millions have still not found jobs after several months. How do you manage rejection and maintain your confidence in a time like this? Um, and I, I think the key is to, to learn from every single rejection. Uh, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, don't just ignore it and like put it out of mind, like write down a sentence, like why did I get rejected here? How can I learn from this experience? And then I view that as a source of strength. Of course, it can be demoralizing to get rejected a lot, but if you combine all these little learnings and, and craft them into a way to holistically improve your appeal on the market, or just uh, maybe have a different focus of which types of jobs and opportunities you're looking for, um, I think the key is like to learn and, and iteratively get better took the words right out of my mouth. That's exactly, that's exactly what I recommend. And then of course there's the like giving, you know, being kind to yourself part. I, any way that you can separate your identity and self-worth from what you do for a living and kind of the external part, I mean, listen, you can only control what you can control. So, uh, I mean, again, this is extremely hard, especially if you love what you do or your own, own your own business, but when you're going to an experience where you have to be vulnerable, right. And applying for work is vulnerable. Whatever happens, Listen, there's office politics. A lot of times jobs that are posted online have actually been promised internally. Uh, this has nothing to do with you, right? So being able to say, and, and this is a practice and I have a whole bunch of mantras that I do here and not to get too woo woo about it. I guess I moved to LA. So this is, you know, I do a lot of meditations where I explicitly say my identity, my sense of self, my self-worth cannot be touched by the chaos around me. So whatever somebody thinks of me, 
that has to be, and you just, for me, a visualization, like there is a barrier between that. So, you know, part of it is being strategic and objective and understanding sort of tangibly what you need to do to improve. And then the other part is maybe becoming a little bit more, you know, again, kind of woo woo about it of, of protecting, you know, protecting yourself. We have so many questions here and I just want to make sure that we don't ask a question that we've already touched upon. So I will go to this question from Justin. Are you finding that networking has been easier when you're located within an existing tech hub? Um, he said that they, he's cold contacted several ind individuals, but once they've determined that he's not in a tech hub close to them, they've passed, but ask that they come back when they move closer. So why is location still important to many VCs? when we're all successfully executing the work from home process, just like big tech companies. Hmm. Very involved question. I have no idea why that would be. I also, and not to like pivot off this question, but I think it's related and maybe Matt can speak to this, not to put you on the spot again. Um, why are these tech companies reducing pay if you move to a lower cost city, right? So if you live in San Francisco, you're being paid San Francisco rates, which I totally get. That's obviously part of the negotiation. It needs to be contextual. But then if you move, you get paid less. You're still working for the same company. And by the way, we're all in front of our commu computers anyway. I know companies are trying to figure this out as, as, you know, this is new for them. So I don't understand, you know, the question that was asked, what the hell, you know, are these people saying, yeah. I don't know if Matt has anything, you know, cause you're an SF and you were, you know, you worked at Facebook. So why, why are they doing this? Answer no, it's, this is a good question. I, I think there's two different philosophies on, on both dimensions. So I'll start with the latter one, which is to your question, Claire, why are people getting paid less if you, we're an engineer in San Francisco and moved to Vermont or a, a different market that might have a lower cost of living. And I think different companies have uh, different ways of looking at it. There's one philosophy where you base or you pay people based off their output. So if you're a remote worker and you're doing the same amount of work that uh, somebody in San Francisco is doing, you should get paid the same amount of money because it has the same impact on the bottom line for the business. The second philosophy is to do more of like the bottoms up, like, well, let's look at the cost basis. Let's look at what, the cost of living is in the location that a person lives in and then sort of use that as the calculus for what they should get paid. And um, I, I've seen different companies uh, do both of the two approaches. And I think a lot of people, a lot of companies are looking for what the larger corporate tech giants are going to do, like the fangs of the world. Um, I think it's sort of going to be a mixture of the two different approaches and it's yet to be determined which of those two philosophies will be the one that wins. But um, yeah, it's definitely been an interesting time. Uh, I know like some of the larger tech companies are making it very explicit. Hey, if you were paid, you know, a hundred dollars while living in San Francisco, if you move to market location two, you'll get paid $85 to the hundred dollars or something like that. Um, and then others are kind of still going with the other philosophy of just, nope, we're going to pay you based off your output. So um, I I've seen both happening in terms of location and like why it might be tougher to, to get meetings with VCs as an example. Um, I mean, that's a really good question. I think, Again, there's two different strategies that tech companies are employing right now. One is that they're going remote forever and they don't ever plan to have a physical office again. And the other is, well, we're kind of a hybrid. We're remote for now, but eventually we do plan to go back in person. Um, there might be somewhat of a slight bias for VCs located in Silicon Valley uh, towards like, oh, well, we still think that a lot of tech activity is happening here in SF, even if it's not today. Maybe it's in 2021 that the tech activity will resume kind of mostly in person. I mean, of course, it all depends on coronavirus. Um, so maybe there's a slight bias there. I don't know. I, it, it, I, I don't have the best answer to the question. Mm. It's interesting to figure out what goes on in the minds of VCs, to be honest. <laughs> um, you just have to find, I think, the right fit, you know, someone that is going to be adaptable and flexible. So, you know, maybe it was a blessing in disguise that those VCs specifically were not open to you. And you'll find, you know, those people that are going to be open and, and flexible to work with you because they are out there. There's a lot of resources out there. So definitely don't stop trying. Um, we are just out of time, but before we go, I want to give, give everyone a chance to sort of give some closing piece, a closing piece of advice. So um, I can put a question forward, or if you just have any final thoughts or pieces of advice, 
um, you can feel free to jump in. So let me know which one you prefer, closing question, or you just want to give some closing words or piece of advice. Thumbs up. And each of one has a different, you can ask me a question, but that doesn't mean everybody else has okay. to answer one. That's so my what, <laughs> So what should folks pay very close attention to in the job market right now? And what should folks look forward to? Never mind. I'll make a personal <laughs> statement. <laughs> Somebody else go first. <laughs> you can choose either one. You can answer that question or you can put, just say a closing statement. I think this is great. We've covered a lot. Um, there's still a lot of questions, but you know, you can find us online. Um, you can find me at, at her agenda, at Nisha's agenda. You can find Claire at Ladies Get Paid. Um, Matt and Adrian, if you want to say what your social media is too. Yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, Adrian, I think you were said. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, I guess, <laughs> at Adrian School, but I'll write it down if you guys need. Um, that's the company. There we go. No, I mean, honestly, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say and not as, as easy to apply, but you guys have to stay positive um, and surround yourself with a really great network because that, at the end of the day, it's, you know, whatever job we do, wherever we move, my, always, my friends are always telling me, like, it's about you have to have a happy life, right? Like, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, anything else, when you take everything out, it's all about, like, you know, are you happy in your life? And what really makes you happy, at least for me, it's the connections and the people. You could have the best job ever, but if you don't have that connection, that social interaction with your people around you, I guess you're never going to feel achieved or, or deep, deep down happy. Um, at least that's for me. So I think just surround yourself with, with people that you can support, work with, have fun with. Um, that's the most powerful thing. And I'm sure that if you're well surrounded, you're always going to find a, a way out or, or a way that will, you know, stay in your, your life, your goals, and, and make sure that you have a happy and good life. Because that's the most important part at the end of the day, uh, regardless of all the jobs and the interviews and all, all of that. Um, you know, being happy with yourself, I think, is the most important thing first. Great. And I want to pass it now back to Adrian to close us out officially. Thank you so much. What an amazing conversation that was. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. I hope everybody learned as much as I did. And huge thanks to Ronisha. Thank you, Ronisha Bing, for moderating this panel. And also thank you so much to our panelists, Adrian DeWolf, Matt Schulman, Claire Wasserman, and also thank you all for joining us and sharing some of your day with us and learning a bit. If you enjoyed this session, please follow Work Life VC across social media and on YouTube and give this video a like and definitely join us for more events. Ciao.